Uh, hello, everyone. Um, my name is Flood, and I have the, the pleasure and honor of being Ireland's first Consul General in Vancouver. Um, first of all, I'd like to thank Foresight and all concerned for organizing this excellent series of very useful and timed uh, webinars on clean tech. I'd also like to thank uh, Leslie Carberry, who is speaking after me on behalf of Ireland, who is our senior official on the green economy side. And, uh, I'm sure you will find his, his input uh, very interesting. As he will speak on, in depth on, on the Irish side, so I would just like to say a few words in general on the Ireland and Canada side. Um, I came here to uh, Vancouver in September 2018 to set up the new Irish consulate, which has uh, two functions. One is from trade, and one is to support the large Irish community here. And since I've arrived, I must say, um, the potential for collaboration between Ireland and Western Canada and the EU and Europe in general um, is very significant. Unfortunately, there appears to be a kind of a, a rocky since the issue on the, on the European side. And the, when visitors come over, they tend to stop in uh, Ontario and Quebec and they don't come to Western Canada. And likewise, uh, being perfectly honest, in Western Canada naturally looks south and looks Asia. But in actual fact, um, Europe is as close to uh, Western Canada as is Asia. There's no particular reason why we didn't. And in this virtual world of ours today, it, uh, it can certainly uh, make, makes little difference uh, when it comes to uh, travel because there isn't anybody traveling. So this uh, series of events, uh, and I must say, it is very timely. Um, Ireland and Canada uh, have much in common, and particularly in the current global situation. It makes perfect sense for us to explore ways to collaborate together so that we can both build back together, as, uh, as Prime Minister Trudeau said yesterday in the Toronto speech. Ireland, for example, like Canada, believes in the multilateral system and is a committed member of the UN and the EU. From an Irish and an EU perspective, in this week that marks UN climate um, efforts, the timing of this foresight webinar couldn't have been much better. The EU, as you may be aware, has recently agreed a 750 billion COVID-19 response plan, 30% of which is allocated to green measures. So there is funding in place. Ireland is a fully committed member of the EU and supports the green economy for economic recovery. In March this year, the EU launched its latest circular action plan for cleaner and more competitive EU. So the policy, policy is there and it's evolving. Only this month, Ireland launched our own waste action plan for a circular economy, which I'm sure Leslie will brief on later. So we have the funding and we have the policy in place. What we now need is partners in innovation. And Ireland is very open to further develop partnerships with innovative people in Western Canada interested in expanding their business into the EU. So this is a very opportune time to work together on the Green Agenda. Ireland traditionally historically offers all partners a very user-friendly entry point into the EU, the largest single market in the world, which is as close, as I said, to BC as is Asia. With Brexit, Ireland is now the only English-speaking common law Eurozone country in the EU. And in my opinion, Canada is as likely to leave NATO as Ireland is likely to leave the EU. So one word I want you to remember from this is certainty. For investors, we offer certainty in an uncertain world. Europe, EU, Ireland is a fully reliable and user-friendly supply chain. It's, Ireland itself is an entry point into the EU and to our other EU partners, such as Switzerland and Finland, which have taken part in this summit. I hope you'll find this, today's webinar very useful. One that will help us to live with COVID-19 and yet transition to a circular economy. One that will encourage us to, to build a Western Canada European partnership that will be a benefit to us all. And at the end of the day, at any time, if there's anything that the British Council can do to assist in this world, please do not hesitate to contact me. Your Margaret, thank you for seat. Thank you, Frank. And now passing over to Andreas Drufer, the Consul General of Switzerland. Yes, uh, thank you, Katrina. Good morning to uh, 
everyone from a rainy Vancouver today and good afternoon to our friends in, in Europe. Um, first of all, I also want to thank uh, my colleague Henk and the team of the Dutch Consulate here in Vancouver for initiating this uh, webinar series, as uh, Frank said, um, comes, uh, comes very timely. Uh, also, uh, thank you to Foresight uh, for coordinating and implementing this event. And um, a big uh, thank you to uh, our Swiss partners for today's event, uh, in particular to David Avery, Head of Clean Tech at um, Switzerland Global Enterprise, as well as the two speakers, Corentin Fibé and Thomas Chisholm. Thank you very much for, for joining. So the, the reason um, that, uh, that we have decided to participate in this uh, event is really to put Switzerland on the international map as a leading country in clean tech. Uh, quick background on, on Switzerland. We are a small country uh, in Central Europe with 8.5 million people. We are a, land, a landlocked country with very few natural resources. One of the natural resources that we have is uh, fresh water from the Alps. Uh, other than that, there is uh, not much natural resources around, so it's really the brain power that is leading Switzerland's innovation and economy. Switzerland has ranked number one in competitiveness and innovation for 10 years in a row, according to the annual Global Innovation Index. So the success of our country's economy really lies in education. Switzerland runs 10 uh, cantonal universities and two federal institutes of technology Na and um, nine uh, University of Applied Sciences, whereof seven of these universities ranking among the world's best 200 institutions. We also have a thriving startup scene. Around 300 startups are being founded every year in Switzerland. Uh, a third point I want to mention are our innovation parks. By now we have five regional uh, innovation parks where really everything happens. Uh, academia and small businesses, startups, etc. are cross-pollinating in these um, in innovation parks and get the, um, the economy going. Now in terms of clean tech, um, I would say our focus and our strengths is in built environments in water, waste management, agriculture and diversity, energy and mobility. Now the Swiss consulate here in Vancouver is also um, working on enhancing bilateral collaborations between Switzerland and British Columbia, um, not only in clean tech, but I do think that we have a common grounds in, in this sector. Um, as an example for an existing important collaboration, I want to mention the um, Swiss-French company Lafarge Holzim, who is a manufacturer of, uh, of cement, which partners with the BC company Swanti on the reduction of CO2. Um, I do hope that um, thanks to these seminars, we can, this will create opportunities to continue um, collaborations between Switzerland and Western Canada in, in, the, in this sector. And I just want to mention another event, a webinar organized by Switzerland Global Enterprise that will take place on October 29th entitled Sustainable Building Business Opportunities in BC. And we have posted the link to this webinar in the, in the chat function. It's the very first uh, entry. Please have a look at this and, uh, and sign up if you're interested in that. Um, with that, I uh, wish you all an interesting and um, um, and informative dialogue today. Thank you again, Katrina, for setting this all up. It is uh, an important series and we're glad to, to be part of it. Thank you. Thank you, Andreas, and thank you, Frank. And so I'll talk a little bit about Foresight Clean Technology Accelerator. We're a nonprofit dedicated to advancing the growth and impact of clean tech ecosystems in Western Canada. We do that through programs for startups and SMEs. We also work with corporations on solving their largest climate challenges that they that they have and we are in essence we are market driven entrepreneurial collaborative and results orientated our success metrics over the past six years show us that we have supported over 500 clean tech companies who have helped to support economic development here in the province of british columbia by supporting 5,000 over 5,000 high paying jobs have raised 250 million in company funding and have also supported with revenues 
We've also recently established the core clean tech cluster. This is a new model for how we're going to work with academia, government, industry, SMEs, and also investors. And our mission is to support a clean economy and position as a global center for innovation, talent, and capital to scale clean tech. And this is the reason why we're here today. As part of our agenda, what we want to do is foresight and core clean tech cluster with the partnerships, with the consulates and industry and SMEs, we want to provide an overview of what's happening in circular economy in both Canada and Europe. And then from here, we'll learn from innovators and corporations on their needs to address the market gaps and figure out how we can solve them together. This sets the stage for a very interesting conversation tomorrow, where there will be a high level diplomatic session, including Canada's ambassador of climate change and various others to really discuss um, the results of the, the webinars this week and you know, highlight some key attributes and partnerships that we can go forward with between Europe and Canada. I hope you can join as well tomorrow. For now, we'll go straight into the panel discussion where we'll, do, uh, we'll have a selection of panelists who will provide an overview of circular economy approaches in both Europe and Canada. We have Les Carberry from Ireland. Uh, we have Yves Laurent Sopaval from Government of France. We have Leah Canning from the Government of Canada. We have Quarantine Fivet from uh, Switzerland, from the Educational Institution, as well as David Avery from Swiss Global Enterprise. And we have Seppo Rantala from the Embassy of, of Finland. So I'll quickly, I'll pass it over to Les Carabri now. Thank you. Thank you, Catriona, and um, good morning, everyone from, from Ireland. Um, it's great to be back in Canada, if only virtually. Um, I spent many happy months over there previously. Um, so my name is Les Carberry. I am the head of the National Circular Economy Unit in the Department of Environment in Ireland. And I'd like to give you a quick run through today of Ireland's 2020 Waste Action Plan for a Circular Economy. It's um, very timely to be talking to you today. We just launched the plan um, on the 4th of September. So we are very much um, at the start of a new chapter on circular economy in Ireland. And if we go to the next slide, did Katrina. So the Waste Action Plan follows on from Ireland's Climate Action Plan, which launched last year. And that Climate Action Plan represented a real step change in Ireland's climate ambition. And since then, the new coalition government in Ireland has committed to an even further um, ambitious approach with an average of 7% per annum emissions reductions to 2030 and to be climate neutral or to be climate net zero by 2050 and that 2050 target is due to be enshrined in Irish law um, in the coming months. And under the Climate Action Plan, a new waste action plan with a focus on cir circular economy was, um, was one of the del deliverables. And the overall objective is to move beyond compliance with EU targets on recycling and reuse and that some of which Frank alluded to, and really become a, a, a vanguard country in the EU in terms of circular economy. Um, the plan involves 200 actions over five years, some which will be put in place immediately, some more medium and long term. And again, there's a real focus on a shift away from just waste disposal and treatment and into more innovative circular economy measures. That'll take a, com a combined approach involving um, putting responsibility on producers and manufacturers to ensure that their goods are environmentally sustainable and to uh, where there are environmental impacts to account for those and also to encourage sustainable new economic models, particularly in the digital space. And part of the, um, of the, of the Waste Action Plan's approach is really a focus on, on awareness and education, particularly at household and consumer level, and bringing people with us. Um, there's a range of uh, measures provided for under the plan in terms of economic instruments and regulations, but really they're supplementary to um, as said, an awareness, awareness, awareness raising effort to make sure that everyone understands that the circular economy is something that they can contribute to, which can benefit the environment and can benefit them in terms of additional value. So if we go to the next slide, please. So before I go on to um, my specific role in the circular economy unit, I'll just kind of run through very quickly some of the priority areas under the plan. So the plan covers household and business and um, waste disposal and segregation, includes 
um, ambitious measures on food waste, including halving Ireland's food waste by 2030. Um, a suite of measures around plastics, packaging and single use plastics in particular, with a view to radically reducing our use of those plastics during the lifetime of the plan and banning a number of them outright. Um, part of that will involve the use of extended producer responsibility schemes. This is where if you put something onto the market, you are then responsible for its, um, for its uh, collection at, end, at the end of the pipe. Um, another sector that, that will be involved is the construction and demolition waste sex, sector, as well as textiles. And as I said, the Waste Action Plan provides for a suite of policy measures um, in terms of regulation, economic incentives around levies, and also increased use of deposit return schemes, for example, in relation to plastics and aluminiums. My own role in that plan is around what's known as the circular economy strategy for government. Um, what we found in Ireland is that for major challenges such as climate action or waste action, we have to take a whole of government approach, bring every single department in, in government in, in, into uh, play and really try and break down silos where we can. So my first um, task in the next couple of months is to do up a new circular strategy for the whole of government, um, which involve a range of issues, making sure that all the policy levers that we have are focusing correctly on supporting the, sustain on the circular economy, particularly around public procurement Ireland already has a centralised public procurement function in our Office of, Office of Government Procurement, and they already take social and environmental um, criteria into account in, in setting procurement policy, but we want to go further on that and really integrate social, economic and environmental considerations into public procurement while still delivering value for money for the, for the Irish people. Um, part of this work will also involve drilling down into different um, economic sectors, same, for example, the hospitality sector, the agricultural sector, the construction sector, and really working out what the circular economy in practice means for those sectors and how government can um, support them. And then, as I mentioned before, excuse me, um, we're particularly interested in how the digital sector can help support the, support the circular economy. Um, our department is somewhat probably unusual among its international peers in that we have the environment function, but also the communications network function. So it's a very interesting mix of seeing how digital technology can work to support um, new and innovative business models around um, the shared and circular economy. So that's pretty much a very whistle-stop tour of where we are, and I look forward to any questions you might have. Great, thank you so much, Les. And now we'll pass it over to Yves Laurent Sopleval from France, and I'll pass it over to you, Yves. Yeah. Um, hello. Hello, everybody. Very glad to be with you this morning and afternoon for us. Um, I have too many slides, so the, the, I, I guess the slides will be available uh, to the participants. So um, most of what I'm saying, I'll be probably talking too fast and uh, many things are in the slides. You have here my email address and if you want to, um, if you want to have any information, I'll be happy to provide some, okay? So next slide, please. Uh, I will focus on the buildings questions uh, uh, rather than on global uh, um, uh, questions. So uh, buildings are an important contributor to climate change and represent 44% of consumed energy in France. They represent 25% of French greenhouse gas emissions from energy consumption of buildings in new space. Construction industry was the source of 227 more than of waste in, 20, um, in 2014, and 42% uh, is for the buildings. Next slide, please. So the, uh, sorry, just, excuse me. France is committed to tackle global warming and has put in place an ambitious strategic plan and legal frameworks. We can quote the low carbon strategy, the law on green growth, and of course, the anti-waste law for a circular economy. Next slide. In line with the terms of the Paris Agreement, we have a, a circular economy roadmap resulting of substantial consultation with stakeholders. 
This roadmap led to anti-waste law for circular economy in February 2020, which includes several measures in order to limit wastes and to contribute to the transition from a, a linear economy to a circular economy. Three main measures will impact the construction fields, the creation of an extended responsibility of the producer, the revision of the pre-demolition audit, and the creation of a tracking document for works outside of waste audits. Next slide, please. Thank you, Eve. Eve, can you um, raise your voice a little bit? People are having yeah, trouble. Right to, okay. Well, yeah. <laughs> it's maybe my computer doesn't. Is it okay like that? Better. Thank you. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay. So I'm um, just switching off my camera. My okay. Great. That's okay. Uh, so an article of the anti-waste law for circular economy requires the implementation of extended extended producer responsibility, system applied to building waste, such as one existing for electrical and electronic equ equipment waste. The French environment uh, and early management agency, which is called ADEM, is in charge of preparatory study in view of the implementation of system start our systems it could be managed by eco organizing or a producer responsibility organization uh, next slide since march 2012 contracting authorities must perform an assessment of waste um, from demolition and major renovation works for buildings which have floor area more than a thousand square meter or contain one or more dangerous substances. This assessment must be performed before the application for a demolition permit is filled or failing that before demolition procurement takes place. This pre-demolition waste audit was not effective enough in its current form the circular economy law changes this by moving towards an approach with, which assesses the reuse and recovery of resources. Next slide. In order to improve the traceability of construction and demolition waste, a tracking document is now compulsory for works which are not subject to the waste audit obligation. This document is delivered to the work company by the person in charge of the collection point where waste have been de deposited. Next slide. Since 2010, three different laws introduced for new construction, the principle of an environment regulation and the goal of the net zero energy buildings. As a result, the French building codes plans that, tw that in 2020, there will be requirements on building carbon footprint based on the life cycle an analysis and taking into account the carbon storage during the building life. It also plans requirements on the use of products from renewable resources and recycling on carbon storage and indoor air quality. Next slide. In order to prepare the future environmental regulation for 2020, France launched in 2016 a national trial phase for the new construction called E plus C minus. And since the end of 2018, complementary technical works and consultations of the stakeholders were carried on. Next slide. The trial phase is based on three tools, an assessment framework, a label, and a database. Next slide. I'm going to skip this one to be more. Uh, well, you you can get back to the slides afterwards, but I'm going to next one. Okay, this one is good. No, no uh, um, previous please. Okay, the general objectives are first a reduction in the climate impact of building, taking into account the carbon emission of the building over its life cycle, promoting the use of construction methods that emit little carbon or allow carbon to be stored, or uh, e.g. bio-based materials. 
encouraging consumption of decarbonated energy sources like any renewable any, uh, heat. Next slide. The other general objectives are better energy performance and lower consumptions. The, uh, reg the environmental reglementation of 2020 would, will go beyond the, reg the thermical reglementation of 2012 requirements. Uh, housing adapted to future climatic conditions, it's important to know that we take into account summer comfort objective, objective now, uh, to take into account heat wave episodes. And dwelling with good indoor air quality and promotion of products from reuse. Uh, next slide. Okay. So for this uh, life cycle assessment, different data can be used, environmental product declarations of construction products and equipment, default values as substitutes where there is no EPD for the product chosen in the project, and fixed values for the calculation of the environmental footprint of the consumptions of the buildings. They are gathered in the French database called INES. Next. So thank you for your attention. And if you need any information, please send an email to, um, to my um, uh, address up, uh, there. Thank you. Bye. Thank you, Eve. We will make sure to share your addre email address with the participants as well so they can get in touch with you. And now passing over to Leah Canning, who's the director of the World Circular Economy Forum as part of the Government of Canada and for her uh, overview on what's happening in the circular economy in the country. Thank you, Leah. Great, thank you. Thank you, Katriona. Um, if we could go to the next slide. Uh, so I'm presenting, um, I'm with Environment and Climate Change Canada, but I'm currently leading the planning of the World Circular Economy Forum on behalf of the whole of government. So I'll try and give a, a brief snapshot of uh, circular economy here in the Canadian context. But I always like to start by highlighting some of our characteristics that make us a little different from our European colleagues uh, in particular who've really been some first movers on circular economy but we have some different considerations so our size <laughs> is an important one Frank talked about his observation uh, coming to Vancouver um, you know in the proximity maybe of Vancouver to or BC to Asia or Europe uh, may actually feel a little closer than even uh, parts of Canada. We're, we're actually about the same size of Europe. And yet we have, uh, I think, about 1 20th of the population. So we're very distributed. Most Canadians live in large cities, but we have thousands of rural, remote, Indigenous communities uh, that are really important to our cultural and economic um, diversity. Um, another uh, interesting feature about Canada I think even management, the province and territories have significant authorities. Uh, we talked a lot in the previous presentations about extended producer responsibility. That's actually a great example because each province and territory in Canada has their own, uh, whether it's product stewardship or a full EPR regime. So we would have uh, up to 13 <laughs> in Canada. Uh, also, our economy, unlike Switzerland, is very resource-based, um, and we're also very export-oriented, so that's another consideration. Um, and then I also mentioned, I think, an important context for us. We have significant commitments around reconciliation with our Indigenous peoples, and obviously the focus recently on uh, addressing systemic anti-racism. These are important contexts when you look at circular economy, which really seeks to be so transformative of our, our economic approaches. So with the next slide, I'll just quickly touch on a few areas uh, where circular economy is really uh, at play at a national level. I will note, uh, unlike some of our European colleagues, there is no national strategy yet or roadmap on uh, circular economy, but I think that reflects a little bit how we, how we work in Canada. Uh, our vanguard, though, is really the Canada-wide strategy on zero plastic waste and the action plan. This was developed through the Canadian Council of Ministers of Environment, so it's a collaborative effort with all federal government and the provinces and territories. And it sets out a vision for a circular economy for plastics. It addresses some of the issues that uh, 
our colleagues from Ireland and France um, have spoken to, which includes EPR and a uh, really robust um, set of actions. But because we are a resource country, we're seeing circular economy really come into play as we look at, for example, our mining sector. Uh, Bioeconomy is another area where circular economy is of great interest. Um, I don't have clean tech on here specifically, but I'll note clean tech is what offers the solutions to implement these broader policy objectives. So very fundamental to all of these. And I'll just note um, that the Canadian Council of Academies is actually undertaking a study right now to look at the opportunities for Canada for circular economy. So that work is expected in about a year's time and I think will really provide some helpful markers for sort of where we may go forward. Um, and I saw there were some questions already about the speech from the throne that um, came yesterday. And I think the Building Back Better Foundation and then really the number of commitments there, they really set the stage for a circular economy to play an increasingly important role. Uh, with the next slide, I'll mention quickly um, the last few years have seen an explosion of activity on circular economy. There's so many things I could speak to and I'll just say um, really seen in the business sector, just um, a number of companies leading the way. They really are the engine of circular economy. So we're seeing uh, circular business models everywhere. Our cities or our municipalities are also real innovators in this space. Uh, I listed four, Toronto, Vancouver, Guelph and Montreal only because they're um, hosting an event next week uh, where they're sort of showcasing uh, what they've been doing and how COVID has impacted their, um, which really it hasn't slowed them down on circularity, but how they're adapting to COVID uh, and still advancing circular economy. And I'll note even civil society, individual Canadians, we see you know repair cafes, right to repair movements, zero packaging stores. I mean, we're seeing the enthusiasm on the ground in our indigenous communities. The term itself is not necessarily widely known yet in Canada, although it's growing, but the principles and the concepts of circular economy are uh, certainly uh, uh, something that Canadians are embracing. So I'll end with a little pitch uh, <laughs> with the last slide for the fact that Canada will be hosting the World Circular Economy Forum in uh, 2021. Initially, it was going to be in 2020, but we uh, postponed as a result of COVID. But this has been actually a really exciting opportunity for some of the Canada EU engagement. Uh, Finland started through the Finnish Innovation Fund. Citra started the, uh, the forum, but the European Commission and a number of European countries have been very active. So it's been a great way to connect Canada with the, the work underway on circular economy as we, we lead up to our event. So I'll put a little pitch for next week. Uh, Citra is hosting the WCF online. So uh, you can check out the sessions there and our colleagues in the Netherlands are hosting an event midway uh, that will really seek to uh, link the climate and circular economy agendas ahead of COP. And then our event next fall, uh, where we are really gonna take a look at what are the big systemic changes that we would need to implement if we're gonna drive circular economy at scale and certainly uh, expect that the clean tech sector and the circular innovation and clean technology will be an important uh, topic for discussion. Great. Thank you. Thank you, Leah. And, and I hope everybody now knows when all these events are happening and know, who to, know who's to contact, you know, when you're talking about circular economy in Canada. So passing it over to David Avery from Swiss Global Enterprise, um, who's going to talk about circular economy and built environment. David? Yes, thank you very much. Uh, if you can flip straight to the next, please. Just a few uh, introductory remarks on where Switzerland is and where it's going. Essentially, uh, everything we're doing in terms of climate change uh, and particularly how that relates to circular economy and the built environment is wrapped up in the energy strategy, which is our legal framework. Uh, Top line goal is essentially in halving emissions by 2030 and net zero 2050, similar to the, the timetable uh, elsewhere and as mentioned by Ireland. The, uh, the CO2 law is currently uh, being debated, at least the second uh, update to the CO2, uh, CO2 law is being debated in the Swiss parliament and stands a, a great chance of getting through, but never, that means in Switzerland that there will probably be a referendum to uh, finally uh, accept or modify it. So what's in the strategy, essentially, uh, it involves uh, various different elements. Uh, and the one I want to focus on today is energy efficiency. Next, please. 
Energy efficiency essentially is driven uh, highly, uh, as was mentioned, for, for France uh, by, by buildings, uh, which are a major contributor, uh, and uh, how the, the whole renovation and uh, uh, building uh, industry is functioning. And that, uh, for now, is being strongly also uh, in the program driven by uh, a lot of research projects, uh, which I will not go into, but which uh, my colleague uh, Corentin will uh, present uh, some specific activities that they are working on uh, in the building sector. So without further ado, please let me uh, hand over. Thank you. Corentin? Yes, thank you, David, for the, the introduction. So I will zoom in here uh, first by presenting um, where I work um, together with Thomas, who will be presenting in a, in a few minutes. Um, um, I'm part of the, the Smart Living Lab. Um, that is a, a research and development center for the future of the built environment. And it's very cross-disciplinary. Uh, we are 105 researchers working on um, everything related to uh, buildings. Um, so those, you have the four main aspects uh, here. We work on well-being and behaviors, construction technologies, energy systems, interactions, and design processes in the, the, the building process. Uh, next slide, please. And um, our um, first, I mean, uh, and main uh, project at the moment is our, our um, own uh, building. And uh, I mention it because um, we, it's going to be completed in 2023, but we want it to be a benchmark for uh, 2050. So answering all uh, requirements, climate requirements for uh, 2050. And not only the, that building is the result of a research project, but that's, um, it's going to be also the generator of a research project, um, mainly focusing on uh, users and the interaction between users and uh, building technologies. Um, and maybe uh, that can help um, and be of interest to, to some of you here. Um, and now I will just quickly explain two projects that, that we have. Um, those are projects that we address in both education and, and research. And um, the first question is uh, this one here. So it starts with the, um, the conclusion that we demolish building way too early. Um, so as soon as uh, the, the building becomes obsolete and we want to replace him for another building with another use, with another height, another density, we demolish it. Whereas um, we could have uh, deconstructed it and reused its parts in new configuration. And so um, the theoretical question that we asked um, ourselves and students was this one, how, what would be the best, the fully circular load bearing system? So a load bearing system such that um, its component um, could be reused over and over in uh, multiple service lives um, and in a wide variety of uh, configurations, spatial configurations. And next slide, please. Um, our answer is this one. Uh, currently, it's a modular slab um, that is actually way more modular than uh, all modular slabs um, worldwide because uh, slabs uh, can be assembled uh, on top of each other and next to each other um, in order to withstand um, an infinite variety of spans between columns. So that means that the, the space that is created by the load bearing system um, um, can vary um, a lot. So the, the system may become obsolete at some point in 50, 100 years, but its components um, will not be obsolete and can be um, reused. So by, with such technologies, of course, we would reduce waste uh, generation, but we would also reuse greenhouse gas emissions. And uh, greenhouse gas emissions, next slide, um, is actually the, the topic of this second uh, project. So if we imagine that um, trusses, for instance, in buildings are dismantled and that we, we, we can reuse, we have access to a stock of um, bar uh, members or of trusses, and we want to design new trusses with new geometries, new spans, new, new layouts. Um, we ask ourselves um, these questions. Um, so what would be the environmental savings of being able to reuse previous components from other stresses in order to 
um, build a new truss. And, and for that, we compare the best solution, of course, with um, the, the recycled uh, steel solutions in this case. And what we show is that for this example that you have here, but also for many other case studies that we've done, uh, usually we, we can reduce the impacts, environmental impacts by 40 to 60% um, by being able to uh, reuse components. And the, the next question for, for that, and that was, oh, sorry, last slide is, of course, uh, what would be the, the optimum uh, combinations of reused and recycling, um, recycled components? Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Quarantine Fivé. And if anyone's interested in learning more about what they do at EPFL, um, we, we have another speaker lined up for panel two who can go into more detail. Thank you. And so now I'll pass it over to Seppo Rantala, who is going to quickly run through Finland's roadmap for circular economy initiatives. Seppo. Hi, hi everybody, uh, and greetings from Ottawa. Um, and, and just the first to, to say that the, uh, as Lee was already uh, saying something about the Canada, I would just like to say that the, the, uh, Finland is a very much uh, also like the Canada, we have a lot of the remote areas, of course, not as much as in Canada, but we are the small nation compared to the others and the uh, very much the depending on the export and the uh, and, and also very much the depending on the brain power as well. And the uh, uh, and, and then just the, uh, the underlining the like like minded countries like the Finland and Canada, there is a love for the, the one uh, one special sports that is the hockey. But then uh, going towards the, the next slide, actually, uh, for the uh, roadmap of Finland to the low carbon circular economy, actually, the Finland was the, the first country in the world in the 2016 when they prepared the national roadmap for the circular economy. And, and the, we had our, uh, four basically strategic goals. Uh, to be uh, uh, to, to using the circular economy solutions that are uh, in the heart of, the, uh, of, of improving our competitiveness and also the economic growth. And then uh, to really to shift to the low carbon energy and having the very much the ambitious calls to the climate and the energy policies. And then also the uh, third one was the, the, uh, the really to see the natural resources as a scarcity, uh, because otherwise we would be uh, not uh, uh, meeting the Paris Agreement uh, as we are uh, consuming the natural resources today, even though we, uh, we are not the most consuming countries in the world, but the, we still, we, with our pace, uh, the, if, the, if the whole world would be using uh, the natural resources as to Finland, we, we would be needing like uh, four, uh, four globe uh, 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 worth of uh, natural resources. And then of course, the uh, everyday decisions are very important for the, uh, uh, to, to meeting those goals. And not, not anymore so much the, uh, the uh, uh, promoting the World Circular Economy Forum that was mentioned already in the LIA's uh, presentation, but it has been uh, 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 established by the Finnish Innovation Fund, CITRA, and the first one was held in 2017. And you still have the time for it to register next week's uh, uh, online uh, uh, forum. Uh, which will be held in the 29th and 30th. And it will be actually uh, 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 concentrating on the very uh, up-to-date topics, uh, the how to building the more resilient businesses and uh, the uh, businesses and the, uh, and the white sustainable finance is a key in the transformation and the where the governments needs to be focusing out how to scale up the circular economy. And the next slide piece, And, and then the initiatives towards the carbon neutral fin, uh, Finland. Uh, so the Finland has been committed already by now that we would be carbon neutral by already by uh, 2035. Like one, and, and the EU target is uh, by 2050. Uh, the dramatic change is being uh, re uh, required when we are transitioning to the low carbon uh, society and the, uh, uh, the, there is the main initiatives that the government has already taken or planning to take. And one of those is uh, uh, to reform uh, the energy taxation 
uh, and the one has already been done, uh, and that's the, the taxation for the, uh, the energy intensive uh, industry. And then uh, there will be a different paths towards the carbon neutral neutrality in the key industrial sectors, and those being in the first hand, the energy, chemical, forest, and, and the technology industries. Then we will be concentrating on the transportation uh, to able to be in a fossil free and, and in a sustainable manner. And, and then uh, the climate change policy plan, what we have in a place, uh, there is a one key issue is the, uh, the uh, decreasing uh, the, uh, the uh, oil heating and the overall energy consumption in the residential homes, but also uh, the, uh, 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 the how the, uh, the uh, building industry uh, is turning to the uh, uh, green buildings and the actually the maximizing the utilization of the raw materials and the, uh, the designing the, uh, the, uh, the houses and the, the materials to be used in the building to be uh, repaired or to be reused uh, all over again. And then there will be uh, the climate program also in the land sector uh, that will be uh, mostly concentrating on, on the uh, uh, to increasing the Finnish net carbon sinks. Finland is very much supporting the EU Green Deal and its objectives and, and the, uh, 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 we are uh, active partner in the Horizon 2020 already and then now next uh, program until uh, 2027. And then uh, the one big part of the, uh, the uh, how to achieve the carbon neutral uh, overall is that the Finland considers that the emission trading must be reformed so that the price of carbon rises. That's all. Thank you. Great. Um, thanks so much, Seppo. And thank you so much to all our panelists. Unfortunately, we have run out of time for the Q&A, but if you have questions, please put them in the chat and we'll make sure that they get answered either by the panelists or by us at the team of Foresight. Um, so, you know, my key takeaways there were that there's a number of strategies ongoing. They do link up very much with climate neutrality. There's uh, countries are at different uh, points in their, in their journey, whether it's like creating roadmaps, creating strategies, I wonder and I hope that there's, you know, points for collaboration with international countries between Europe and Canada, you know, as they're building their strategies out, whether it's phase one, phase two, phase three. And so what I'll do now is I'm going to actually pass it over to Anna Stukas, who is our moderator for the second panel. And Anna, I'll pass it over to you. Wonderful. Thank you, Katriona. And good morning, everyone. My name is Anna Stukas. I'm the Vice President of Business Development for Carbon Engineering. We are a Canadian clean energy company that is commercializing direct air capture technology. So the ability to capture carbon dioxide out of the atmosphere, at which point from a circular economy perspective, you can either put it back underground where it came from or combine it with low carbon hydrogen to produce drop in compatible ultra low carbon fuels uh, that are essentially recycling your fuels out of the atmosphere instead of pulling it out of uh, the ground. So we have an exciting panel today spanning multiple sectors of the circular economy, ranging from waste to carbon to water to energy to construction. Uh, our panelists today include Jennifer Wagner, President at Carbon Cure Technologies, Robert Van Spinglen, uh, Director of Business Development at Ostara, also from Canada, from the Netherlands, and I apologize to all of my panelists that I'm probably but butchering your names. Uh, Marike Klomkamp, Business Development Manager from Waste Treatment Technologies. From Switzerland, we have Thomas Husselm, uh, Professor of Building Energy Efficiency at uh, the HEIA University of Applied Sciences and Arts in Western Switzerland. And from Finland, we have Seppo making a, a reappearance from Business Finland. Uh, so with that, very excited to turn it over to each of the panelists uh, to hit on very quickly, just a brief introduction to themselves, their company, and a one minute point on what their specific needs to scale are. And we'll start uh, with Jennifer at Carbon Care. Sure, thanks, Anna. 
Um, hope everybody can hear me okay. I'll try to keep it uh, brief. So uh, good morning from uh, Prince Edward Island. Uh, I'm on the east coast of Canada. Uh, thanks for having me here this week. Uh, we've been on our, our journey for the last decade or so, uh, but I really do feel a sort of renewed sense of momentum and optimism over the last six months or so uh, with all the climate pledges and carbon neutrality commitments. So really exciting time to be uh, having these conversations. Uh, so the way we look at it is we recognize that to meet our climate targets, we need to do two things. We need to reduce the amount of emissions that we produce, but we also need to remove the CO2 from the atmosphere that's already been emitted. And we call this carbon removal. And this is the space where Carbon Cure operates. Uh, so Carbon Cure is a Canadian high growth climate technology focused on the concrete industry. And our mission is to reduce 500 million tons of CO2 uh, annually by the year 2030. Uh, I would say we're the world's most advanced carbon utilization technology. Uh, what we do is we take CO2 uh, out of the air and use it to make products. In our case, we're making concrete. Uh, by adding the CO2, you're also making the concrete greener and stronger. Uh, it's a retrofit being used by about 300 plants around the world today, uh, mostly in Canada and the US, uh, also in some parts of Asia and South America. And we are just about to launch our expansion into Europe. Thanks, Anna. Wonderful. Thanks so much, Jennifer. Uh, turning it over then to uh, Robert. Yes, good day, Rob from Spengelen. I'm based in The Hague in Holland, but working for a Canadian company in Vancouver called Ostara. Uh, Ostara started about uh, 15 years ago with actually uh, recovering phosphates out of waste streams, yeah? specifically uh, initially on the wastewater treatment plants. And next, what they did is they also said, okay, we take it out, but how do we get the, the outputs coming out? How do we actually move it towards the farmer? So we actually getting a, a, a fertilizer out of the wastewater streams. And we've been, uh, we have roughly about uh, 22 um, installations currently, mainly in uh, about 80% in the US. And we've got about three, four installations in uh, in Europe, one in Holland, in Madrid, in, in London, we've got one. And we're just building one in, in Poland and some new ones coming up in the moment. Now, what we actually are doing is uh, by, by making a fertilizer uh, out of the waste stream, we also actually avoid actually emissions uh, when you would make a normal uh, fertilizer. Yeah, a normal DAP. So actually the farmers actually could save roughly about 90% on, on greenhouse gas emissions by using a recycled uh, phosphate. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you. Uh, Marike, over to you. Hi there, you're pronouncing my name pretty good. Thank you. Okay, <laughs> thank you. Uh, I'm Marike from the company Waste Treatment Technologies, also based in the Netherlands, in Oldenzaal. Uh, we are a company that is uh, founded in 1996 and mainly based in the treatment of organic waste streams um, into AD, AD systems, composing uh, systems and the complete odor abatement system. Uh, last year our company was merged with Renewy Canada, which is a waste operator, uh, which has four facilities within Canada operating by themselves. And we used to do the design build part for them in the past, but now we are working together and are expanding our business within Canada, especially within uh, British Columbia and Alberta, but also in the eastern part of Canada. Um, and our flagship project is currently in uh, Surrey, BC, where we built a fully closed loop facility in 2015, where we did build an AB system together with composting using the biogas um, producing the AD system for as a kind of uh, RNG uh, for the uh, waste hauler. Um, by doing that, we did close the loop for the biogas production. And after that, the compost coming out of the composting facility is brought back, back to the Surrey uh, uh, yeah, municipality. So they can use the can as a fertilizer and grow the vegetables on it. Um, currently, we as group are uh, yeah, processing 300,000 uh, tons a year, and we would like to expand that in the next three to five years to double it to 600,000 tons to 1 million. That's it for now. Wonderful. 
Thomas, uh, over to you. Hi, thank you for the invitation. Uh, so I'm Thomas. Uh, I am both a professor at the University of Applied Science in Western Switzerland and also co-founder uh, of VSCAB, uh, which is a French-based startup, but also a spin-off of the Polit Polytechnical uh, School of Lausanne. And my uh, research and development uh, interest and activities is focused on the development of methods and tools to support decision makers towards comfortable, low energy and low carbon buildings uh, in line with the carbon neutrality objectives at the horizon 2050. So um, on my side, um, if I can, if I may, uh, what do we need at this uh, stage uh, is to uh, support uh, policy makers uh, to strengthen uh, uh, regulation with a clear carbon budget per buildings because, because so far we've got carbon budget at the national scales but then we have to split this between different industries and to uh, give a clear carbon budget per building. So this is nowadays a common issue that uh, different countries have to deal with. Uh, it is also what was um, uh, presented before by the French, uh, the representative of the French ministry. And we also have to work together to uniformize the carbon accounting methodologies across the different countries. Uh, so on our side in Switzerland, uh, we've got uh, cut, cutting-edge cutting research and development methods uh, to support all this process for these policy makers and, and building uh, makers. And we are able, also able to provide feedbacks uh, from uh, leading countries about this subject uh, to develop uh, buildings which are in line with this carbon neutrality uh, uh, starting, uh, that will be mandatory, uh, for instance, in France, uh, starting to uh, from 2021 and uh, on which we are working in Switzerland now since, uh, since uh, a few decades. Uh, so I'm really happy to share this with you and, and, and open to any further discussions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Thomas. Uh, and I apologize. <clears throat> uh, this is actually a, a different CEPO than our first CEPO. Uh, this is CEPO Tosavainen, a senior advisor to Bin Business Finland. And CEPO, over to you. Thank you. Thank you, Anna. Yeah, really, I'm another SEPO. We have two SEPOs. I'm sitting in Toronto. Another one is in Ottawa. So good morning, everybody. My name is Seppo Tossavainen. I work for Business Finland in Toronto office. We have a real Nordic trade promotion hub with Finland, Sweden, Norway and Denmark in the same office. Uh, Business Finland is the Finnish government organization for innovation funding and trade promotion. I've been in international business for over 30 years, first in private sector, in clean tech and bioeconomy, before moving to serve trade promotion with Business Finland nine years ago. I've been working in Finland as a Canada link starting from 2016 and moved to Toronto to open Business Finland office in October last year. I'm proactive in the circular and bioeconomy with special focus to energy. Uh, I'm active in our Smart Energy Finland uh, program, where Canada is one of the target markets. Uh, we have about 150 member organizations and companies in the program. Uh, what we, we are looking for, our needs to scale. So um, in this discussion, I'm focusing to energy. Emissions from the energy sector, manufacturing and traffic account for 71% of global greenhouse gas emissions. Uh, besides exploring business opportunities, we are looking for possibilities to create joint research and development platforms to speed up transition, transition to carbon neutral economy. Uh, because energy generation, including heating, has a huge share in global emissions, we cannot reach, reach the climate change targets just by electrifying traffic. Of course, it's important, but it doesn't change the big picture enough. In, in Canada and Europe, many people are talking about electrification as a final solution. A lot of energy is needed to produce heat for heat, heat for existing houses and industries. I think it's practically impossible to solve all the heating needs by electricity in existing infra in cold climates like Finland and Canada. Obviously, we need some hybrid solutions to decarbonize heating. For example, using biomass as a heating fuel, where it makes sense, like in smaller cities, close to forest industry activities, 
uh, there is also room for new solutions, including power to X and hydrogen renewable natural gas, waste heating of industries and municipalities, including geothermal solutions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, everyone. Uh, so in going into our, our panel discussion, we have a few questions that we'd like to tackle uh, as a group and then time allowing, uh, we'll open that up for uh, some Q&A from the audience if we have time. Uh, I want to pick up on one of the points that Thomas raised, uh, which is that in order to incentivize adoption of some of these technologies, there are specific sector-based policies that are required. So Thomas mentioned specific carbon budgets for buildings. Uh, here in Canada, much has been made about putting a price on pollution and having an economy-wide uh, carbon price. There are a number of other jurisdictions that are having significant success with what you might call a flexible regulation, something like the low carbon fuel standards. Uh, so as you all think through um, key policies and incentives that can really drive that adoption of your technologies, uh, where would you go first? What would you want to see implemented in sort of the two, five, and 10 year timeframes to really allow you all to meet the ambitious targets that you've uh, just uh, introduced us all to? And, and perhaps, um, why don't we go back in reverse order and, and Seppo, we'll start with you. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Anna. Yeah. Yeah, if we, if we think about the, uh, what, what we need to enable a fast transition, so policy is everything. So there has to be a long-term political strategy with action plan, laws, regulations, and initiatives to enable this systematic change. Uh, to give you an example, in, in Finland, we have had long-term policy to increase biocomponents to transport fuels. It's, uh, it's uh, also European Union level, but our targets is a little bit more ambitious. Uh, partly because of this driver, our major Finnish oil refining company Neste is today the biggest biodiesel producer in the world. They are also active in Canada. And uh, right now, based on the public sources, the company is looking for sustainable synthetic carbon hydrogen fuel options too, including hydrogen and CO2 captured from industry. So these kind of uh, business uh, business related actions will happen sooner or later when policy is there. So that's basically the, something what I would like to say. Thank you. Wonderful. Thomas, would you like to elaborate on the, the targets for buildings in particular? Yes, thank you. For, um, I'm glad to jump in, in this subject uh, because uh, for the construction industry, it's clear that without any carbon budget, uh, then the, it's a whole chain of values that will not be uh, accelerated uh, because, in fact, the carbon budget at the building scale uh, will uh, make it mandatory for architects and engineers to start thinking about the whole life cycle of buildings. It will make uh, 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 it will shake the construction industry uh, to develop uh, building components and material in accordance with the overall carbon budget per buildings. Uh, so it's a whole system that have to uh, to start and I'm quite uh, confident now that without any carbon budget, the fact is that the construction industry have a lot uh, of constraint already uh, with um, acoustic constraints, fire constraints. I mean, there is a lot of constraints. So everyone wants to build uh, low carbon buildings, but uh, everyone have uh, other higher priority uh, uh, at this moment. So uh, without uh, any uh, policy on this carbon budget, I'm afraid that uh, we're going to wait uh, quite a lot uh, to, to move forward towards uh, carbon neutrality. And as we know that uh, um, there is a high responsibility of building uh, for carbon emissions, not only for the user buildings, but uh, on the top, most of all, uh, for the, all the embedded impacts for the all other part of the life cycle of the buildings, uh, really, really have to, to start thinking uh, uh, with, with the life cycle uh, assessment uh, towards all the decision makers from the real estate developers to the industry uh, uh, that provides uh, materials and components. Wonderful. I'm going to jump around a little bit in our order of, of panelists and go to Jennifer to 
uh, build on that further because I know Carbon Cure fits very much into that construction framework and interested to get your thoughts complementary to Thomas's on, on what can incentivize technologies such as Carbon Cures. Yeah, and I think, um, I mean, the, the comments I'd like to make, I, I think apply to other sectors as well. But uh, before I jump into incentives, I would like to say that at least our view is that I think the business needs to be viable in the absence of incentives. Uh, I, it, you know, it's not good enough to just deliver an environmental benefit. I think there needs to be an economic advantage uh, to industry as well. Um, and I think Canada has done a great job. Um, I think we should be replicating some of the models that have been shown to work here. Um, Canada has a ton of funding available for early stage R&D projects uh, around circular economy. Uh, and there's some sort of creative, like more prize based models as well, which have been shown to work really well. So I think of uh, the $20 million Carbon X Prize, which is wrapping up this year in Calgary, um, uh, Emissions Reduction Alberta, had a $30 million grand carbon challenge, which uh, is ongoing as well. Uh, there's a few other examples. So lots of uh, dollars available for early, but also sort of seeing this uh, emphasis on later stage opportunities as well, which obviously you need, you know, different funding mechanisms to get those uh, technologies which have been validated actually off the shelf and into industry. So I think that's a whole other subset of activities that need to occur. Um, but something that we're really excited about is that in terms of incentives, uh, private sector is playing a, a sort of a more prominent role than we probably would have anticipated uh, through some of these new climate pledges and carbon neutrality commitments. So um, just I think it was last week, uh, we announced uh, Amazon and Breakthrough Energy Ventures led a round in Carbon Cure. And I think we, it was the first tranche uh, in Amazon's new climate fund. Um, so a great example of a company which hasn't typically been uh, into the sort of circular economy space, but they're sent, they sort of recognize that uh, they too have a responsibility to try and uh, solve some of these climate problems. So uh, love to see that. And then also um, uh, seen a couple announcements related to offset purchases. So for technologies that reduce CO2, you could be eligible for carbon offsets. Um, and uh, typically, you know, you'd sell to, you know, I know the province of Alberta, uh, of BC has purchased them in the past, but companies like Stripe and Shopify are also purchasing offsets too. And the way they see it is that they want to inject uh, cash into the space of uh, companies like Carbon Cure, so that the costs of reducing CO2 can come down over time. Uh, and sort of uh, Shopify and Stripe were some of the first to make these announcements, but there's sort of a bit of a trickle down effect. Uh, Microsoft, Amazon, Apple, Google, even Walmart, uh, they're all going uh, pretty far to make these carbon neutrality commitments. So uh, I think those um, levers can kind of accelerate um, the space. And the last thing I'll say is on policy. Um, we've also seen a few examples where um, procurement can be used to accelerate technologies that are ready to go today. Um, so Hawaii, there's an example where um, uh, some of the local uh, authorities there gave preferential treatment to suppliers who offer uh, CO2 and concrete. So that incentivizes local producers to adopt technologies that offer uh, lower carbon products. Uh, and then there's something pretty interesting happening in New York right now where there's a state bill uh, that's using a slightly different model where they're saying uh, vendors who offer lower carbon products can get a 5% artificial price cut in the bid selection process. So there's a few different examples of uh, how this is being implemented, but it's all really designed to, um, to accelerate the space of uh, clean technology. And, uh, and we're really excited to see the progress there. Wonderful. Yeah, absolutely. And, and we're certainly seeing the role of government procurement, including in the government of Canada's recent clean fuels uh, RFI, where uh, government procurement can help to backstop some of the market risk created by these nascent policies that are intending to incentivize decarbonization. Uh, for Marika and Robert, uh, with your companies uh, sort of being at the forefront of uh, that Western Canada European collaboration, I'd love to pick up on what some of the key tools that you think are uh, to really promote and continue that collaboration and that sharing of ideas across jurisdictions. Uh, what's enabling you to scale uh, in a transcontinental uh, fashion? Um, and Marika, perhaps we'll start with you and then go to Robert. That's good, thank you. Um, 
Yeah, what, what I do think is, is I look to, um, to the last couple of years and already the grow between uh, Holland and Canada based on our um, uh, work field. I think there are already already made a lot of steps in it. Um, so if I look to, for example, just to municipalities and governmental uh, stuff and, and, and also the tender, uh, the tenders that are coming at the moment, we see that there is a really an, a, a change in, in, in how the government is thinking about um, yeah, how to handle waste and how to collect it. So, it, so I think if you look to that, there, is already, there are already steps made and I think for the future uh, it can grow much further. So for that, yeah, I, th I think yeah, it's going to be uh, only positive from our side at the moment. Wonderful. Robert, your thoughts? Uh, our thoughts, I think the, the issue we're currently having in, in growth that will be solved with the new fertilizer laws in Europe, yeah, when they come online, because then the product coming out of the waste the water industry or the struvite coming out becomes a, a standard fertilizer. So that will help. But one of the other things that would or could help is actually the fact of carbon credits. Now, currently, the uh, the product is eligible for carbon credits, but the, the current price level of the carbon credits is so low that it's, uh, especially where where are you going to sell it? Because uh, we're using, uh, we had pharma site, yeah, that's where we where we go. But the question is, where, where can you get rid of uh, the carbon credits? The good thing, though, on the other hand, is that the, um, the industry Anna, is actually being um, uh, formed by all the supermarkets. Yeah, the supermarkets in Europe are actually determining what the farmers are going to use. So if we're able to get the supermarkets to think more holistic also on the carbon credits and recycle phosphates, yeah, that will drive uh, business throughout Europe. Wonderful. Uh, so I know that we're just at the, the end of our allotted time. Uh, perhaps just to sum up, I think what I heard from across our panelists were a few things, uh, particularly on uh, the benefits of sector-specific uh, targets or regulations that are tailored, recognizing that different sectors have different needs to scale, that it isn't a one-size-fits-all. Uh, the power of early adopter leadership from large corporations such as Stripe, Shopify, Microsoft, and Amazon uh, that they can have in driving the adoption of these technologies into the mainstream. Uh, and then finally, the role uh, perhaps that uh, both government collaboration and government procurement initiatives can play uh, in driving these uh, circular economy innovations forward. Uh, so with that, thank you so much to all of our panelists. Uh, really enjoyed the discussion today. Wish we could have spent another hour on it. Uh, so with that, I'll, I'll turn it over to Catriona to wrap things up. Thank you, Anna, and thank you to all our panelists for joining as well. What a, what a great lineup, and it was really interesting to hear both the government perspective on circular economy and their strategies, but also what are the innovators doing, whether it's around carbon or buildings, uh, around waste and water, you know, these are the people who are creating and the companies who are creating um, the, the businesses of tomorrow and today and whether these are great companies to be supporting when we're thinking about meeting carbon neutrality and circular economy goals. So I'd like to just highlight that Foresight currently has a program with the Trade Commissioner Service, where it's called SDG Connect, where we're able to work with European corporations uh, that are large scale. And what we can do is ho host an open uh, innovation solution platform. So any global company based in Europe who's looking for Canadian solutions around clean tech, it might be in circular economy or other areas, we're happy to make those connections for you. Um, so if you're interested, please contact me or my colleague Jacob, his, uh, his contact details are highlighted there. So in terms of next steps, if you're interested in getting in touch with this, interested in uh, connecting with the speakers, please, please do let us know. We will be sharing a recording of the session after this with all of you, all of the people who signed up, as well as a, um, as well as the contact details of the key speakers or the consulates as well, who'll be able to field all your inquiries. 
Um, we do have another session on tomorrow. It's going to be more high level and diplomatic, but it's with, you know, we have a ministerial representative from British Columbia. We also have the, the Canada's um, ambassador for climate change. We have the Dutch ambassador and we have a key corporate and also uh, our CEO, Jeanette Jackson, who will be leading the discussion tomorrow and panel on how do we connect clean tech recovery and climate. And, and it's quite important because a lot of the discussions that we're having this week, all through the week, you know, whether it's hydrogen or Monday, power management on Tuesday and circular economy today, we'll be sort of reflecting back on that tomorrow and how can we make those connections in times of COVID and support recovery going forward. So we hope you tune in. And if you have any questions at all, please do contact my colleague here. Her name is Elizabeth Thorson. So, um, yeah, if there's anything else that if you if you have any more information or you require more information or links, please do drop us a note. We're happy to field all the inquiries to the right people. Thanks again and have a great day.